confession. Uh, and ultimately then, uh, for you and I, that you and I uh, would learn something as well. That you and I uh, wouldn't just look and say, wow, uh, Jesus can walk on water. That's great. Uh, wow, Jesus uh, turned water into wine. That's amazing. Uh, but that Jesus turned water into wine, uh, and therefore that means that for me today. Uh, and so, uh, as I said a few weeks ago, the ultimate question uh, is, so what? What difference uh, does it make? And uh, the story this morning uh, is one that probably we have uh, the easiest time, uh, it's the easiest for us to take and go, oh, I see how that applies to me today. Uh, and that is when Jesus calms the storms. And, uh, you know, it's real easy for us to take that one and just make a real simple leap forward and say, uh, well, if Jesus can calm uh, the storms, then uh, He can calm the storms uh, of our life. He can deal with the issues uh, in our life. And so it's a real uh, easy jump. Uh, but uh, when we do that, uh, we miss something, I think, uh, that, uh, that this particular miracle uh, teaches us. And it hinges around uh, one word, uh, that uh, we don't use. It's still out there. Uh, I, I hear it occasionally. Uh, and that is this little word, tempest. Uh, that's a word that uh, probably none of us really use. You know, uh, I, I have it's been, you know, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody uh, come in the next day and say, man, that was a real tempest we had yesterday, wasn't it? Uh, you know, we just don't, uh, we just don't talk about that. Uh, you know, probably the, probably the only time uh, you ever hear that word is uh, when you hear people use that, uh, that uh, old phrase that you hear occasionally, a, a, a tempest in a teapot. That's probably the only, and I'm not sure we know what that means, but, uh, you know, we say it. And so, uh, tempest is just not a word that uh, we throw around very often, but it's a word uh, that changes, I think, everything about this particular story and, and this particular miracle. Uh, the Bible says that uh, that's what the disciples, that's what they were dealing with. They were dealing uh, with a tempest. Now, a tempest, um, again, I think most of us, if we were uh, thinking of a tempest, we would just uh, make it pretty quick. We'd make it a, a bad storm. Uh, but a tempest on the Sea of Galilee was something uh, completely different. You'll notice if you read this text, if you read the whole story, uh, that the Bible talks about winds and waves. It never talks about rain. Now, I think most of us, when we think about uh, the idea of a tempest, we would think of a typical uh, summer thunderstorm. That's kind of uh, what we would have in our mind. The wind, the rain, the storm, the thunder, the lightning, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the evening thunderstorm that blows in in, in, in July, August. That's kind of, uh, I think, what, uh, certainly what I would think of because, again, I just don't say tempest. But uh, a tempest in the Sea of Galilee to a sailor would have been something entirely, uh, entirely different. The tempest, uh, part of the idea, uh, of under, part of the way we understand it is to understand the word itself. The word tempest uh, comes from uh, the Greek word seismos. Uh, and uh, probably most of you recognize uh, the idea of seismos, seismograph, earthquake. Um, and so uh, the idea uh, of seismos is shaking. And so when they were thinking of a tempest, they, they were thinking of a, a shaking. It wasn't so much uh, about the storm, but about the effects, the, uh, the shaking of what uh, would happen. And what, what it really involved, um, and, and this was common, it's something I don't know that we have uh, really anything for us uh, comparable. Maybe some of you that uh, have traveled, uh, been away from this general area might have something uh, as a point of reference. But most of us, uh, I don't think, have anything to really uh, compare a, uh, a tempest to, uh, not on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee uh, is about uh, 680 or so uh, feet below sea level. And so it's basically basically uh, a hole in the ground. It's, uh, it's way low. Uh, you know, it, it's down, uh, again, 680 feet uh, below sea level. But to compound that, not only is the, the sea itself uh, 680 feet below sea level, it is pretty much surrounded by mountains and uh, all the way around it. And then uh, on the sides are really large mountains and then uh, to the north. Uh, uh, is a range of mountains, and, and down the 
middle of that uh, range of mountains is uh, the water then that comes down and, uh, and feeds the Sea of Galilee. And at the bottom, uh, there's another place where it goes, back, goes on out. Uh, and the mountains on the side uh, have uh, low spots in them and culverts. And, and what would happen with a tempest? Uh, you, know, most of us, uh, you know, most of us today, if not all of us, uh, we're, we're kind of used to uh, you know, turning on the weatherman and, uh, you know, and, and him telling us, you know, uh, next July the 4th, it's going to rain. I mean, that's, you know, they've almost gotten to that point. They can tell you, you know, they start telling you weeks ahead of time uh, what the weather is going to be. Now, I'm not a big weatherman fan. Uh, I very seldom uh, pay any attention to the weatherman whatsoever, unless I think there's snow in the forecast and we might have uh, to change or cancel a church service. Other than that, if all the weathermen on the earth disappeared, it would be several weeks before I knew it, okay? Uh, My style of weather uh, is kind of like, uh, you know, like this. Years ago, uh, when David was just a little fella, uh, and I doubt if he even remembers it, but we had this uh, rock when we were living in the parsonage, it was hung right beside the back door. It was on a red piece of yarn, and on that, uh, there was a rock at the end of it, and it had a little card on it, Uh, and it said, Said this weather forecaster. He said, "If ra- if wet rain, if white snow, if stiff ice, if missing hurricane." Uh, you know, and, and that's kind of my style for the weather. You know, I, I don't pay much attention to it. I open the door, I stick my head out. If something wet hits me in the head, it's raining. Uh, you know, if I stick my head out and nothing wet hits me, but my head becomes wet, it's hot and I'm sweating. You know, that, that's just kind of you know, if you know, if you let the dogs out and they come right back knocking on the door, it's cold. You know, I, I, I you know, that's my style of weather. I, I'll cross it when I get there. Uh, and but uh, th- these guys, it wasn't so much a a weather-related event. You know, when you and I in the summer, we, we look off and we say, man, it's, it, we're going to have a storm this evening. You know, you, you can see the black clouds out on the distance. You can, uh, a lot of times you can even begin uh, to hear the thunder rumble uh, off in the distance. Sometimes you might, uh, depending if it's dark enough, uh, you might see a, a flash of lightning off in the distance. Sometimes uh, you even, uh, you, you, uh, you get a little smell, just a, a smell in the air of a summertime storm. You know, some of you, you're like, Man, my knee's acting up. It's going to rain. You know, uh, you know, everybody's going you know, to, we can kind of tell they're coming. But a tempest wasn't that way. Uh, a tempest was one of these things that was uh, basically invisible till it was on you. Uh, again, it wasn't about the clouds. It wasn't about the thunder. It wasn't about the rain. It was really all about the wind. Uh, again, if you'll notice in the story, uh, in a moment, the, the, the disciples are going to say, wow, who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? There, there's no mention uh, of rain in this story. And so it's not like a, uh, a typical thunderstorm. These guys, uh, and uh, you know, it was something that was a common occurrence because of the geography. The, the mountains uh, pretty much acted what, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a weather term or not, but it would act a lot like a funnel. And the winds uh, would just kind of just be funneled right down uh, onto the Sea of Galilee, and you know you're you know you're sailing along, you're fishing, you're water skiing, you know laying out in the sun, whatever it is you do, and, and the next thing you know, you know your boat's upside down. I mean, it was just uh, you know just those kind of storms came out of nowhere, and, and so there is uh, I think a, a large difference between a uh, a storm and a tempest. All of us deal with storms on occasion. All of us have storms come into our life. But uh, as I look at them, and I distinguish between the two, one of the things that, uh, that I, again, a storm. Uh, most of the time, uh, you know, you look off into the sky and you see, well, there's dark clouds, there's thunder. I hear thunder. I, I, I hear lightning. Uh, you know, there's a storm coming. Let's get in the house. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and so, you know, I, what I see is, generally speaking, most of us in our life, we deal with storms. We kind of know they're coming. We, we, you know, as a matter of fact, a lot of times we contributed to their coming. You know, we, you, know, I, you said something, did something uh, you shouldn't do. Uh, you know, you know, they're, they're, you know it, a lot of times, uh, you know, you go to the doctor and, and the doctor comes in and goes, uh, you know, your, your cholesterol's up. Most of us go, yeah, I know. You know, you, you know, I didn't need to pay you for blood work to know that. I knew that. You know, I know what I've eaten. I know uh, it's up. You know, most of the time. Well, I don't know about you, but I've heard this story anyway, uh, how it works. Uh, you know, I, not, not that I've witnessed it, but I've heard about it. Uh, you know, that the policeman will come up, tap on your window, and he'll walk up and go, you know, do you know how fast you were going? 
Yeah, you know, most of the time, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, and that's all you clocked me at? Boy, you missed me when I was really moving. Uh, you, know, uh, you, know, and, you know, most of us, the storms in life, we know about, we could have told you they were coming. You know, we know what we did, we know what we said, uh, you know, uh, you know we, we knew that, you know, you know, the, the, you know teenagers, you know, you know, the report card does not surprise you. You know, uh, you know that, that you get the report card and you look at it and you go, I knew, that, I knew it was going to be bad. You know, uh, you know, and, you know, most of the time we know they're coming. A tempest, on the other hand, uh, are those things that, uh, like the disciples, again, there was, there, there was no warning of, about the tempest. Boy, it just, it just came up out of nowhere. And so uh, I want us to talk about for a moment the, the difference. Now, we can certainly talk about storms, and, and, and all of us, you know, we, we've had marital storms. Uh, you know, when we said we did something we know we shouldn't have done, and we paid the price. We've had job storms where, you know, we didn't do a good job, we laid out of work, whatever, and the boss is angry. We knew it. We knew it was going to happen. Didn't surprise us at all. You know, those kinds of things happen. What we're talking about this morning are the tempest of life. Those things like the disciples are dealing with here that come seemingly out of nowhere. Several things I want us to understand, first of all, uh, about these tempests that, uh, that, that hopefully will uh, ease our minds just uh, a little bit when we understand uh, a tempest. First of all, when we understand the reality uh, of the situation. First of all, they are unavoidable. I want you to understand, and I think you see that from reading the story this morning. The Bible tells us uh, that Jesus tells them uh, in the verse previous, let's uh, command them to get into the ship and go to the other side. They entered the ship uh, and uh, with his disciples, followed him, and, and there arose a great tempest. When you read that story, you don't see anywhere where the disciples did anything wrong. You know, Jesus said, get in the ship, they, and, and they followed Jesus onto the ship. It, you know, we, we don't see where, and, and several of these guys were uh, skilled fishermen, skilled sailors. We don't see uh, whether they, uh, we don't see where anywhere where, where they read the weather and said, I believe we can beat it. You know, uh, you, you read the story in Acts when Paul uh, was being uh, transported to Rome. If you remember that story, you remember what Paul did? Uh, Paul went to the captain of the ship and said, listen, it's not a good time to be sailing. You know, it's dangerous right now. And the captain said, we're going. And they sailed out. They sailed in the middle of a storm. Uh, the ship was uh, run aground. And, and, I mean, it was a disaster. We don't read that. Th this ship, uh, these men got on the ship, and, and, and it was simply unavoidable. I, I will guarantee you that if you could, uh, you know, I mentioned last week the time machine. If you would borrow my time machine, and you would go back in time, and you would go back uh, to the harbors around Galilee, and you would walk up to anybody there who had sailed for any length of time and ask them, have you ever been caught in a tempest on the Sea of Galilee? They said, yes, sir, buddy. You know, they're scary. You know, you know what, what, what happened? Don't know. You know, uh, are you going sailing again? Yep. Do you think you'll be caught in another one? Probably. You know, there, there was just no way to predict or to, to estimate when they would come. It wasn't like... You know, they, 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 they did anything to bring this on themselves. Now, again, most every one of us are very familiar with both of these circumstances. You know, most of us, you know, and, and, and I, will, I, I will lump us together. Most of us men who are married, who have ever had a girlfriend, hopefully not at the same time, who are, you know, who, are, who have been associated with females. How's that? been around a woman, mother, sister, anything, you have felt in your soul, in your brain, in your heart, that what I'm about to say is going to result in great pain. Don't look at me like that, Martin. Say yes and move on. Zelda's already said it for you. Okay, you knew that if I say this, if I do this, it's not going to be good. But there was just something in your genetic makeup that couldn't put on the brakes. You know, you, you, you felt it. You know that if these words come trickling out of my mouth, it's not going to be received well. 
And yet, there's something that happens in our minds that it's like the back of our minds are greased with Crisco. And whatever, I mean, they don't trickle out of it. Out they come. And we know it. And we plunge headfirst into it. And we know it's going to be trouble. We all know about the storms. And again, most of the time, we make them. But every person in here is equally aware that there have been times in your life when you got up and you were having a marvelous day. I mean, your eyes came open. You had slept all the way through the night, hadn't had to get up, go to the bathroom, dog hadn't barked, phone hadn't rung, nothing. I mean, you had went to bed. It's one of those rare occasions you'd got a bath. You had went to bed at 9 o'clock. You'd got in bed. Some of you looked at me like, 9 o'clock? I must stand up that late. 9 o'clock, whatever. <laughs> and you would slept all the way through the night. And you woke up the next morning. <laughs> I mean, it's a great day. You got up and you had a good hair day or a good skin day, depending on your circumstance. You know, and, and everything was going wonderful. You woke up and when your eyes came open and your nose began to work, you went, somebody's cooking bacon. I mean, is there a better smell in all the world? You know, wake up to the smell of bacon. 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 And you drifted through the house and you ate bacon. And you get dressed. And it just so happened the clothes you picked out that day fit. You know. And, and, and when you got dressed, you know, you didn't get down to the last piece of clothing you were planning on putting on and find out it was in the dirty clothes and had to start all over. Everything is going great. And you walk out and you get in your car to go, not to work, you have a paid day off. You're going to the park or to the lake or whatever. Or for you ladies, you're going to Walmart. It's a great day. For us, you're going to Walmart, we're going to the lake. It's a great day. And you stick your key in the car. Rrr, rrr, out of nowhere. Or worse, rrr, it cranks up, and it gets you about halfway to the Walmart, and it dies out of nowhere. You've been eating bean sprouts, and cauliflower, and broccoli, and all that other stuff that God never intended for us to eat. <laughs> these are called canines. God gave us these teeth to shred meat. He put us at the top of the food chain for a reason. Cows eat broccoli and cauliflower. I eat cows. Okay? You've eaten broccoli and cauliflower, and you took your vitamins, and you've been running all over town, and when you come back from running, then you ride your bicycle. And when you get done riding your bicycle, you do your Pilates. And then you wash it down with green tea. <laughs> and you go to the doctor, and your cholesterol is 250. And you're like, wait a minute, where'd that come from? All of us know the difference in storms and tempest. And they are unavoidable. I would like to stand here today like, like a lot of the preachers on television and tell you, oh, if you'll just come to church and read your Bible and pray and do good, everything in life will turn out great. I hate to break it to you, but there are a lot of biblical characters who would tell you that's not the way the ball bounces. They ended up on the wrong end of a sword. They ended up burning at a stake. They ended up on a cross. Sometimes... The tempest of life are just simply unavoidable. They're unexplainable. I don't know where they come from. I don't know why they come from. Again, these disciples were in a ship with Jesus. I don't know how much better you can do. You know, unless you're on a ship with Jesus eating broccoli and bean sprouts and drinking green tea. I don't know that you can do any better than following Jesus onto the ship when he says get onto the ship. And yet... They still end up afraid for their life. They're unavoidable. They're unexplainable. They, they come along in life 
And, you know, they, they just make no sense why this is, you know, that there is, you know, I don't want you to raise your hand. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm including myself. There is not a person in this room who hasn't at some time done their very best Chris Christofferson impression. Some of you are young enough, you have no idea who Chris Christofferson is. Some of you won't even know what I'm about to say. Some of you have done your very best Chris Christofferson. You know what I'm about to say? How many, who knows what I'm talking about? Why me, Lord? What have I ever done? Yeah. Why me, Lord? They're, unav- they're, they're unexplainable. They're unavailable. They're, they're, they're unavoidable. But here's what's really uh, upsetting about these tempests that come along in life. They're unsettling. They're, they're, they're unnerving. It, you know, it, it, it's nerve-wracking to go through these times. I don't know about you, but for me personally, I'm not saying I, I like it. I, I just, I can somewhat deal with the storms, the messes I make. If I say something stupid, I know that would amaze some of you, but if I was to say something stupid, that was to upset my wife. After 30 years, I've learned to take my beating, okay? I've learned, I said it, deal with the consequences. Yeah, that's just, you know, that's just the way it works. Some of you in here can identify maybe with this part of it. I'm a diabetic, many of you are. There are mornings when I get up, and check my sugar, and it's a really ugly number. I know none of you diabetics ever have that happen, right? You know. But most of the time when that happens, I go, yep, I earned that number. You know, I, uh, I earned that one. That piece of cake was worth every bit of it. You know. <laughs> there are times, and I just deal with it. I, I, um, I did it. You know, I did it. Yeah, there it is. There's the result. There are times, and every diabetic in here can identify with this. You get up, you stick your finger, and that number, you're like, where'd that come from? I ate bean sprouts and cauliflower with Tommy. You know, I don't know what in the world happened. And that's, that's unnerving. That's unsettling. When you go along, listen, if you drive your car... You know, and you drive it, and you never change your oil, you never change the air filter, you, you know, you never put air in the tires, and you find yourself stranded beside the road, most people have enough sense to go, well, it's amazing it took this long. But if you change your oil regularly, you change the air filter, and you do all the maintenance, and you do all those things, and you go out and you go, you get mad, don't you? That's aggravating. You know, that, that, that is, it's disturbing to not know why this is happening. Once again, uh, you know, and I'm sure if, you know, if one of you ladies want to come up here and get equal billing, um, you can come tomorrow. Uh, you know, today it's my turn. Uh, you know, but you know, men, is there anything much more disturbing than to know your wife is unhappy and you don't know why? If I know why, I at least got an idea what I got to do to make it better. You know, you know, what I got to do to fix it. But it's unnerving. When, when I know she's upset, and I can't quite figure out what I did. Or I'm pretty sure I didn't do nothing, and somebody else done upset her and sent her home to me. You know. <laughs> it's unsettling. Tempests are unsettling. They're, they're disturbing because they come from nowhere. They're unexplainable. They, they don't make good sense. And when that happens to us, we, we see the results. What, what happens out of, uh, out, of these, uh, out of these tempests? First of all, there's doubt. I, you know, I, I can identify with these disciples. You know, here they are. They're da, 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 going to the other side. Row, row, row your boat. Woo! Anybody ever been on a boat, a ship, when the storm got really bad? I can swim. I'm, I'm a pretty decent swimmer. It's still scary. You know, it'll, it'll get your attention. You know, it, 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 will, it will worry you. You know, row, 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 woo, you know, and all of a sudden your boat's upside down. You know, that's kind of scary. And the first thing these men do is, is, I like this. They go to God and they say, Lord, save us, we perish. Now, 
It's easy when you look at that to see three words. Lord, we save us. Forget about those three words. Because i got to be honest with you. I don't think the disciples had a lot of confidence in those three words. I'd like to tell you about all that. I just don't believe it. Because if they would have said, Lord, save us, I'd have a lot of confidence in their faith. If when it was over, Jesus wouldn't have said, Oh, ye of little faith. I would have a little confidence in their faith. It's those last two words that jump off the page. Lord, save us. We're dead. We die. Doubt. Those, that, you know, when, when, a, when a storm comes along in life, we kind of know what causes them. We know kind of, but when a tempest comes out of nowhere, we're like, what happened? I'm dying. And so the first thing it does is it causes us to doubt. Again, there's not a person in this room who hasn't been in a situation, who hasn't been in a circumstance where they said, Oh, Lord, what is going on? Why don't you care for me? Why don't you love me? Why is this happening to me? Lord, we got on this ship. We're following you. We followed you. It's important. I think that's one of the, there's a lot of little details of this story that are really important. And I think that's one that's critically important is to when you read the beginning of this story, they followed Jesus onto the ship. And they say, now we're dying. It caused doubt. It caused discouragement. Notice something that, there, again, a lot of little details in this story. Notice right here that there's something I think, real, one letter, not even a whole word, but a letter that I think is really important. It's this little letter right there. That S at the end of disciple. Do you know what that means? Remember your English good enough to remember? Plural. Well, you are learning something up there. I said a while ago, he told him he wasn't learning anything up there. He said he wasn't. I believe he is. I know he didn't learn that at Concord. Uh, you know, um, it's plural. Plural. So what does that tell you? The disciples. Any of you that are here that are parents or ever been around a small child, ever had the marvelous, wonderful privilege of at about 3 o'clock in the morning, Daddy, and you wake up with two eyeballs right up in your grill, you know. <laughs> the face that you love more than life itself. The face that is attached to the little child that you would give your life for. But then at three o'clock in the morning, one inch from your face causes you to want to strangle. You know that face? Can you imagine... Some of you parents just had flashbacks. <laughs> Can you imagine that look? Here Jesus is, sound asleep. If you read before this, he'd been healing, he'd been teaching, he'd had a busy day. He was tired. He lays down. He wakes up. 24 eyes. <laughs> and these are not 24 eyes of your children. These are 24 eyes of hard-headed disciples. Wake up. Let me tell you what I think that statement tells us. If the disciples hadn't given up all hope, one disciple would have went to wake up Jesus. The other 11 would have kept rowing the boat. The other 11 would have stayed on their post. The other 11 would have been rowing, managing the sails, managing the, uh, the tiller. They, they, you know, the other 11 would have been bailing water, something. But all 12 leave their post and they go to Jesus. You know what that tells me? That the tempest had caused them to say, it's over. It's over. We're done. We're toast. We're not going to make it. Tempest bring doubt. Tempest bring discouragement. Tempest bring distraction. Again, little details in this story. Back up with me in verse 18. Really even before the story starts. This, this story, if you read this chapter, Jesus is going along healing and doing some things. Then in verse 18, he tells his disciples something. And then we have about four or five verses of him having a conversation with somebody else. And then in verse 23, we come back to the story of the disciples on the ship. 
Look at verse 18. Important piece of the story. You've got to know what's there, or it changes everything when you understand this. Look in verse 18. What does Jesus say? Jesus says to his disciples, He gave a commandment to depart to where? The other side. Do you notice what it doesn't say? Come on, let's get on the ship and go drown. Come on. Now, he doesn't say there won't be bad weather. He doesn't say there won't be a tempest. He never promises smooth sailing. Do you see that? He never tells them the wind's not going to blow, the waves are not going to crash. But what he does tell them is get on the ship, we're going to the other side. That's what he does say. That there's a lesson you, so again, there, there are a lot of people out there today, a lot of snake oil salesmen passing themselves off as preachers who are telling you that if you'll read your Bible, if you'll go to church, most of all, if you will send them money, you will have it smooth for the rest of your life. Can I be honest with you? They're liars. They're charlatans. They're, they're money-grubbing scoundrels. I would say worse, but I don't know any worse, Okay. They're crooks because the Word of God is clear, example is clear, life is clear, tempest come. But Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Tempest distract us from where God wants us to be. Tempest distract us from being who God wants us to be. Tempest keep us from being the man, the woman that God wants us to be. You, you, you're sitting and you're going on about your life and, and, and all of a sudden out of nowhere you get ready to balance the checkbook and the checkbook doesn't balance and life seems to be falling apart and God has told you to trust Him. God has told you, I, I want you to give. God has told you all these things. And all of a sudden the tempest comes and you forget all those things. Tempest calls us to doubt, they cause us to get discouraged, they cause us to get distracted. Why? Because they're unavoidable, they're unexplainable. We don't know where they came from. What do we learn? How do we deal with a tempest? How do we deal with something that is unavoidable, unexplainable, and unnerving? How do we deal with something like that? You very well can't dodge them, they're going to pop up. You, you can't get away from them. So what do we learn? What The, the, the rescue of the Lord. Here's what we see. Notice what happens in verse 25. They, in the midst of this tempest, go to Jesus. Again, I've already told you, I'm not bragging on their faith. But I'm reminded, you know, Jesus is going to say in just a moment, if you look down there, He's going to say to them, why don't you have any faith? Or, or actually, He doesn't say, why don't you have No, He says, you have little faith. But can I remind you what he says about a little faith? Anybody remember what the Bible says about a little faith? Even the faith the size of a mustard seed? He says what about that? You might know how big a mustard seed is? About the size of the, uh, uh, of the head of a, a straight pen. And he says what about that much faith? Move a mountain. Now let, let's think that through for a moment. Anybody in here moved a mountain lately? Yeah. So what does that say? That says we must not even have the faith the size of a mustard seed. And so Jesus doesn't say to him, you don't have any faith. He says you have a little faith. But yet even that little bit of faith led them to the feet of Jesus. They had enough sense, even in the tempest, to say our only hope. Is Jesus Christ. Our only chance is Jesus. They were led. They were learning. They were learning. During this whole time, look what Jesus says to them in verse 26. He says to them, He says something here, Why are you afraid? Again, little detail. He doesn't say what are you afraid of? Have you ever noticed, let's be honest, your parents ask you some dumb questions. 
And you have asked your children some dumb questions. And I can assure you little ones in here today that eventually you will ask your children some dumb questions. You want me to give you something to cry about? No, I'm good. You know, and think about it. When do we ask them that? You know, we ask a child who is crying, do you want me to give you something to cry about? No, I already got something. That's what started this whole conversation. You know, we, we start out with some wild, we, we ask some wild questions. You know, the storm's booming and the, the thunder's crashing and the lightning's flashing. And we'll look at our child and say, what are you afraid of? I know what he's afraid of. Jesus doesn't ask them what they're afraid of. Jesus asked them, why are you afraid? You understand there's a huge difference in what are you afraid of and why are you afraid of it? What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of this tempest. No, no. Why are you afraid of it? Didn't you just see me not an hour ago cast out demons? Didn't you just see me an hour ago healing sick, feeding the hungry? I didn't ask you what you're afraid of. Why are you afraid of it? See, I, I, you know, I, I, I've, you know, nobody here, it's not a secret. Y'all know it. I think I'm getting a little better in life. Y'all know I'm scared of death of lightning. I don't care if you like that or not. You know, I, I'm scared of lightning. It's just that simple. I don't like it. Don't know why. I'll tell you what I'm afraid of, but I don't know why. I don't know that I've ever been hit. You know, I don't think I've ever been hit by lightning. Might explain that weird twitch I got. I don't know why, you know. I don't even know that I've ever even been close to being hit by lightning. I don't know anybody that's been hit by lightning. You know, y'all can laugh so you want to. You're scared of snakes. I'm not scared of snakes. You got a snake? Call me. I'll come help you. As long as it's not in a thunderstorm. Okay? <laughs> what are you afraid of is one question. Why are you afraid of it? It's a totally different question. Why are you afraid of the tempest? I told you, get on the ship. We're going to the other side. So why are you afraid of the tempest? If he be for me, who is against me? Greater is he that is in me. So the question is not what are you afraid of? The question is why are we afraid? Jesus doesn't say, Jesus knows what they're afraid of. They're afraid of the tempest. The question is why? Well, it might kill me. Okay, why are you afraid of it? Paul says what? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Why am I afraid of life? I don't know. If it hits me and blows me up, you know where I'm going to land? All my little pieces are going to land in the presence of God. You know, and I'll still be afraid of lightning. You know, I just I probably have a reason then. Why are you afraid? They were learning. Here's what they were learning. There's no reason to be afraid when Jesus is on the ship. And so the question is today, is Jesus on the ship? That's the question. Are you did you follow him? They were led, they were learning. And then finally, when when we see this, the the final thing uh, that we see here, is not only were they led and they were learning, but they were liberated. Would you agree with me that in all likelihood, those disciples never looked at a tempest the same way again? Would you agree with me that every time the wind blew from then on, they go, I know who controls that stuff. I don't know where it's coming from, and I don't know where it's going, but I know who can make it stop. Every time they saw the waves crash onto the shore, they thought, I don't know where they've been, and I don't know where they're going, but I know who can tell them to lay down. They never looked at a tempest the same because they looked to Christ. Listen, they were no longer thinking. They, they were no longer terrified. When the Bible says, I like this. Again, one of those little details. There was great calm. Anybody here know the difference in calm and great calm? 
No difference in calm and great calm? Here's my suggestion for the difference in calm and great calm. Would you agree with me that it's calm in here right now? Calm, right? And God forbid, I, 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 you know, right up there with lightning, can you imagine if all of a sudden we had an earthquake? And this place began to shake and shimmy and the lights began to swing and, you know, and the hymnals bumped up out of the pew holders and, you know, Tommy fell out on the floor and, you know, he'd jump up and say he was in the spirit. He wouldn't blame it on the hurricane uh, or the earthquake, you know. But, you know, can you imagine? And, and, you know, when the earthquake stopped and we realized that the building hadn't fallen in on our heads and the lights were still hanging and we were all still okay, that, my friends, is a great calm. <laughs> that is a great calm. Some of you here are old enough to remember Hugo when it came through. You remember, you remember how Hugo worked? You remember about hurricanes, right? At that time, the house I lived in had a massive pecan tree in the backyard. I, I love pecans. I, hate, I wish they come up like peanuts because I hate pecan trees. Because they get stuff all over your roof, turn your roof black, and they get this goo all over your car. I hate pecan trees. This pecan tree happened to be in the house I lived in that had belonged to my great-grandmother, and all her children thought, that tree, God lived in top of it, and that I couldn't cut it down. Uh, you know, and, you know, and so I'm standing there when Hugo's coming. And you know how hurricanes work. When Hugo's coming across, and, and, and the wind's blowing this way, away from my house, I'm like, blow, baby, blow! <laughs> and then there's that calm right in the eye. But then in a little bit, you know what happens when the hurricane passes? Guess which way the wind's blowing now. It's not blowing away from the house. It's blowing towards the house. And now I'm standing at the back door going, no, baby, no! You know, I love you, pecan tree. Stay there forever. Because it was a big one. If it would have fallen, I'd have been sleeping in a teepee somewhere or something. I don't know. Now, when that part of the storm passed over, it was a great calm. There's a difference in a calm and a great calm. You know a great calm after a great tempest. Some of you this morning know great calm. You need to come and kneel at this altar and say, God, I want to thank you for the great calm. Some of you have been really blessed and you don't know a great calm because you've never had to deal with a great tempest. You just say, thank you, Lord, for the calm. Lord, I want to come and thank you for the calm. Some of you this morning are right smack dab, smack dab, that's, y'all know that phrase, right? Smack dab, right in the middle of a tempest. Everything that can go wrong is going wrong, all at once. Isn't that the way it works generally? And you're, going to, you're willing to say this morning, you know, Lord, I've tried everything, I've done everything, I've talked to everybody, and I don't know what else to do. but I'm going to trust you. You need to come this morning and kneel at this altar and say, Lord, in the middle of this storm, in the middle of this mess, in the middle of this tempest, I'm going to trust you. You hear this morning, the greatest thing you can do is follow Jesus onto the ship. You hear today and you don't know Christ. You've never accepted Him as your personal Lord and Savior. You need to follow Him today. You need to come and kneel. Let us show you from God's Word how you can know Christ, how you can become a Christian. You are a Christian and God's been leading you. You want to come be part of this church family. Whatever God's leading you to do. He's speaking to your heart today right in the middle of the tempest. It's time to trust Him. I want to ask you to bow your heads for one moment as our musicians come. And in the still and the calm of this moment, as you think back and you look over your life and you think about the tempest that God has brought you through, you want to come and kneel and say, Lord, thank you for the calm. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for taking care of me. You're here today and you're in that storm. You're in that tempest. You need to come. You don't know Him. You need to come. Whatever God's speaking to you as we stand together.